right so in today's class we shall discuss about firewalls and intrusion detection systems um, so essentially today's topic of discussions will be uh, we shall actually first uh, discuss about intrusion detection systems we shall consider the definitions types of intruders category of intruders and also what are the functionalities of intrusion detection systems and uh, see some of the techniques which are used by these kind of systems to essentially observe the vulnerabilities or the, uh, or the threats to network. Then we shall discuss about the in important topic about firewalls, consider the definitions, constructions and discuss some of the principles which are used uh, behind firewalls. So, intuition detection system is essentially the process of monitoring the events which occur in a computer system or network. Now, the signs of violations of computer security policies and so essentially that uh, which are standard security practices, these are observed by the intuition detection systems and the intuition, intuition detection system observes for any possible violations of what are thought to be secured practices. Now, there are essentially two important broad categories of the intuition detection system as such. One is called the intrusion detection system and the other one is called the intrusion detection and prevention system. So, that is the, uh, so there are essentially two parts and it is probably difficult to exactly draw a line between them. So, one while concentrates in finding out or detect the security breaches, the other actually prevents or blocks any threats. So, an IDPSS or correct as it is collectively called has become a very necessary addition to the security infrastructure of nearly every organization. So, looking uh, into little bit depths, uh, we shall actually see like uh, for example, like there are three types of intruders. So, intruders are broadly categorized as masqueraders, misfeasers and clandestine users. So, masqueraders are typically outsiders from the trusted users and are not authorized to use the computer systems. So, essentially they uh, generally penetrate the system by uh, by essentially some legitimate user account. So, basically it is kind of like it like as we have seen in the last days uh, masquerading attacks in network protocols. So, it is like it tries to, these kind of attackers tries to uh, mimic or imitate a legitimate user and uh, create uh, havoc or create attacks in the network. While on the other hand the misfeasure is a typical insider and legitimate user who accesses who actually has got access of resources and but, but, the, but the thing is that although they are legitimate users, they are essentially accessing resources which they are not authorized to use. So, essentially you can say that they violate or misuse the privileges that they are provided with. And the third kind of intruders are known as clandestine users. So, they can be both insiders and outsiders and these type of intruders typically gain supervisory access to the system. So, these are this can be the broad three categories of intruders. Now, as we have told that the intuition detection system can actually broadly be categorized into IDS and IPS which is the intuition detection system and the intuition prevention system. While the first actually concentrates and automates the intuition detection process, the second one has an additional feature that it also tries to stop the intuitions. So, so we shall actually go into little bit depth and first of all we shall actually, actually consider some of the usages of IDSs. So, these so, as we have seen that IDSS, the normal usage of IDSS are essentially uh, in monitoring the network and look for vulnerabilities and also on the other hand to take some actions to prevent those attacks. But along with it, they also have got some other functionalities like they do some amount of quality control in which they actually not only I mean they, 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 they continuously check that whether your security policies which are in place are correct or not. So, they may take some steps like uh, like uh, if there are some incorrect settings to your firewalls, they will do th those corrections, they will raise alerts whenever it sees that uh, the, uh, the network traffic is actually not blocking uh, some, some traffic because of configuration error. So, basically it kind of does a quality control of the security policies which are enforced, the implementations and security policies. And uh, along with it a very important functionality is to document the existing threat of an, to an organization that is the maintain logs about the threat that they detect. So, later on if there are, has been some attacks, people can revert back or uh, refer to these logs and can actually see what has actually gone into the network. 
The other important functionality is like since IDPSs are placed, it generally deters individuals from violating security policy. So, it is something like as we know that in shops, if, it, if there are some CCD cameras, then the thieves are generally, um, they, they, they essentially shall probably are more scared uh, to, to do some uh, criminal activity. So, it is something like if we know that we are cont continuously being monitored, the users know th that they are being monitored by IDPSs, makes them less likely to commit violations. So, this is a kind of uh, uh, functionality which the IDS is also performs. Along with it, uh, it also of course, per definitely performs the preventive actions and uh, it, it essentially adopts several responsive techniques. The responsive techniques could be like from simply uh, identifying exactly that which network connections or which user sessions are creating threats and to block them or it could be a drastic measure like even blocking all accesses to a target host. So, depending upon your security measurement, the IDS takes some pre takes its pre preventive actions. Now, the IDSS, uh, the IDPSS also changes the security environments, which means that uh, it will change the security environment to stop an attack and this could actually include reconfiguration of the network firewalls, application of patches as we have seen in the last class like if there are some vulnerabilities detected in the system, then it is also important to update the patches. So, the IDPS also does this functionality of updating the patches which are suspected to have vulnerabilities. Along with it, uh, it also does some amount of normalization, which means that if there are some the the, the, the network tra the payload of the network traffic, if it contains some uh, suspected headers, then they are removed. This actually helps to uh, prevent some kind of attacks and they also often remove the malicious attachments from incoming files and pass the clean email to the recipient. So, this is also some important functionality which the IDSS, IDS performs. Now, since the IDPS technology actually adopts statistical methods to comprehend the threats to the system, so they have some accompanying attribute of false positives and false negatives which comes with any statistical measure. So, as we know that false positive we will indicate that when the IDPS actually incorrectly identifies a supposedly harmless activity as malicious and false negative on the other hand is like when an IDPS fails to identify a malicious activity. As we immediately understand that the false negative is something which is probably more threatening. So, therefore, the first objective will be to prevent or reduce the false negatives and then uh, if there are some false positives which comes along with it, then additional measures can be taken to uh, really understand whether the detected packets are really harmful or not. So, uh, there are various uh, detection, system, uh, detection methods which are followed by IDPSS. Uh, one of the most uh, rather known techniques or rather com most uh, primitive techniques would be like which is a signature based intrusion detection system. So, in this a signature is essentially a defined as a pattern that corresponds to a known threat. So, signature based detection is the process of comparing the signatures which signifies a known threat against the events that are observed. So, this could be a sim I mean examples could be like uh, for example, there is a telnet attempt made with root as a username. So, if we, this is a typical example which is generally prevented by the IDPSs. The other thing could be like if there are some attachments which are suspected, then the IDPS actually does the normalization activity and removes these attaches, attachments. But then these are extremely simple methods and actually which can use string matching techniques as the, as the underlying principles. And uh, the idea is that the current packet of the log entry is matched to a list of signatures and if the match is found, then those packets are blocked or stopped. Now, this being a very system, simple technique, or of course, it is ineffective against unknown, th unknown threats. For example, if simply someone can modify the name of the subject or maybe modify the name of the uh, attachments and can go undetected. So, uh, they cannot actually, uh, the other uh, backdrop, uh, the weak po bad point about this kind of techniques is that they cannot pair a request with a corresponding response like uh, it cannot say like okay for example a 403 which is uh, i mean which is a, i mean uh, an error status code that uh, which is a prohibited uh, website which has been accessed so that it cannot pair with to the, to the corresponding request which has been made so this uh, uh, inability to uh, or the incapability of remembering previous requests when processing the current current one actually uh, makes a uh, rather uh, actually makes it like uh, uh, that these kind of uh, detection schemes cannot detect attacks that comprise multiple events. That means, if none of 
uh, uh, that is if an attack is built out of actually multiple events then these kind of signature schemes cannot prevent them because it cannot actually uh, pair the previous requests with the current one. I mean you cannot remember a history of the requests and the responses and therefore these are incapable of uh, preventing attacks which comprise of multiple events. So, uh, the other uh, important detection scheme which is known is known as the anomaly based uh, detection scheme. Now, these uh, detection schemes are actually based on the process of comparing definitions of activities which are supposed to be normal against observed events to identify deviations. So, an IDPS which uses anomaly based detection schemes, so essentially it generally builds up profiles like it builds up the profiles for the normal behaviors of the users hosts or network connections or applications and it matches the present activities, act activities with those profiles. Now, the, uh, the important advantage that one can derive out of anomaly based detection systems is that it can be used to detect previously unknown threats. So, for example, like uh, the system could be based like if, the, if there is a malicious activity, uh, suppose a profile is built out to essentially capture the uh, power consumption of the of the device. So, the idea is that if there has been some uh, infection from a malware then the power consumption of the device can increase. So, such kind of detection scheme helps like in the fact in the, in the, in the because of the fact that although your malwares can vary like it, it can come from an unknown ma malware, but the technique of detection is through a means which is actually immaterial or does not really depend on the exact mode or form of attack. Like for example, if uh, it, it does not actually de uh, depend upon which malware is attacking because the signature is something which is quite common and general like the power consumption of the computer. So, this act actually helps to or rather can be very effective in detecting previously unknown threats. Now, uh, so therefore, talking about profiles there are generally two ways in which a profile is built one is called the static profiles and other one is called the dynamic profiles. Now, static profiles are generally not changed for a long period of time until the IDPS specifically tells it to change it, while on the other hand a dynamic profile continuously updates with additional events. Now, as we understand easily that because of the inherent dynamic behavior of the networks and systems, if you maintain a static profile then it will get outdated very soon. On the other hand, dynamic profiles actually do not suffer from this deficiency, but dynamic uh, profiles also there is a kind of uh, there is a weak point about dynamic profiles that they can actually be used by attackers to fool an IDPS because the thing is that for example, an attacker can slowly increase its activity and initially the IDPS can think that the rate of increase is not alarming and therefore, what it will do is that it will add the increased uh, activity into its uh, profile and thus what what and then once the moment it is uh, it is it is added the, the malicious program can actually further increase its activity. So, in this way it can actually incrementally uh, increase its activity and finally, can evade the, 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 the intrusion detection prevention systems. So, therefore, this is uh, so if you use the profile it has to be a combination of static profiles as well as dynamic profiles. Now, uh, there is another problem with IDPS technology implemented with anomaly detection methods that is they have the problem of false positives. That is they often treat the benign activities as malicious events. For example, a system administrator's very typical job could be to include backup of large files. Now, this could be actually treated as a profile for an attack and therefore, although this is a benign activity can actually raise false alarms in the network. So, this kind of uh, so therefore, it is often difficult to decide whether a raised alarm is false due to the complexity and the number of events that have resulted in the alarm and therefore, this also needs to be kept in mind that an, an, an anomaly based direction systems um, can actually come with the problem of false uh, positives. Now, the other important method of uh, for or rather based on which the intrusion detection systems are built on is something which is called as a stateful protocol analysis. Now, in this kind of protocol analysis, they often compare predetermined profiles of generally accepted definitions of benign protocols activities for each protocol state against observed events to identify deviations. So, the idea is that this, uh, this kind of systems uh, act also are based on the profiles, but the thing is that these profiles are actually 
uh, are dependent on the states of the protocols. So, therefore, there is a concept of state, uh, rather it, it depends upon the concept of states in the inherent protocol. Now, this actually the, the, the reason why this stateful analysis is often useful is because it helps to uh, monitor the security of, of very common uh, file transfer protocols or protocols of this nature which has got inherent states involved. So, therefore, for example, like the FTP or the file transfer protocol session can be visualized to consist of two states. So, one is for example, the unauthenticated state and the other is the authenticated state. Now, in the unauthenticated state, while there are very few operations, I mean there are, I mean, there are actually very, uh, there are several op operations in the, um, there are actually very few benign operations in the unauthenticated state. For example, like providing user names and passwords and seeing maybe health manuals. Okay. So, therefore, uh, the IDPS actually considers operations which are benign or malicious depending on the present state of the protocol. So, therefore, this is this stateful protocol analysis is actually useful because it helps to monitor the security of uh, protocols which actually have got inherent states in them. So, another point which needs to be kept in mind is that unlike anomaly based detection schemes which use host or network specific protocols, stateful protocol analysis relies on vendor developed universal profiles that specify how a protocol should work. So, therefore, this is actually not dependent on the host or the network specific profiles, but it is actually specified previously by the vendor. So, therefore, whenever a protocol is being developed, the vendor actually is uh, is essentially specifying what is meant by a benign profile for example. Okay. So, therefore, this is uh, a, a very significant difference from the previous that is the, the that is the anomaly based detection systems that is the pro both uses profiles, but there is a difference in the profile which a anomaly based detection system makes and the profile which uh, uses and the profile which a stateful protocol analysis use. Okay. So, so therefore, based on the, there is also a further I mean as we have seen like based on the prevention techniques you can classify the IDPS technologies. Similarly, also you can classify your IDPS technologies depending upon where it is actually used. So, the IDPS technology is often used for the network, it is known as network based IDPS technologies. So, they monitor the network traffic for the particular uh, network. So, it uh, basic uh, and uh, as also you can have your wireless based IDPS technologies which monitor the wireless network traffic and analyzes suspicious activities and looks about the security of wireless networks. And you also have your network based anal analysis which actually examines the network traffic to identify threats that generate unusual traffic flows such as the distributed denials of service attacks or which is commonly called as the DDoS attacks. You also have the host based attacks which monitor the characteristics of a single host and the events which occurred within that host for suspicious activity. So, depending upon where the IDPS technology has been used you have got various classifications of the IDPS technology. Now, we come into the other part of our discussion which is the firewalls. Now, what is a firewall? So, the firewall is essentially a single point of defense between two networks and is an extremely important field of study with the tremendous growth of industry in the recent days. So, the access to internet is a, I mean, I mean although it is a great source of information, but of course, it comes with the accompanied uh, problem of that you have to ensure that there is really security in I mean security is maintained in the in the in the enterprise. So, therefore, uh, uh, although in, in, uh, access to internet comes out with a boon, there is an eerie fact of opening up the inside information to the external world. So, therefore, this is actually a huge amount of concern for industry. So, because they have got their rights and other thing which if the uh, business uh, business uh, secrets which if it is leaked then the entire business can get compromised or hampered. So, therefore, understanding and designing of proper, proper uh, firewalls is important and uh, so looking into this I mean a firewall is essentially nothing but a router or maybe a group of routers or computers which enforce access control between two networks. So, there are two networks who do not trust each other and a firewall is kind of a guard which sits between them and tries to enforce the, the mechanisms like uh, access controls between these networks. So, typically the firewall actually uses a pair of mechanisms, it uses a mechanism which is called as allow which actually permits the traffic and the other is of course, of course deny which actually blocks the traffic. 
Now, there are some fibers which actually emphasize on blockings, while some are which are not so, uh, uh, which are not uh, like, like them. So, they essentially emphasize on actually permitting the traffic. Now, so therefore, uh, a, a, a very common name which is known as the demilitarized zone is actually a separation between the external perimeter of a network and the internal perimeter of a network. And uh, the firewalls are essentially kind of guards which are actually sitting between the, uh, between the internet and the DMZ that is the demilitarized zone and the DMZ and the internal network. So, so therefore, for example, when you are considering an information exchange from the internet to the internal network, then you are more bothered about the integrity, you are not actually bothered about the confidentiality of the data. Okay, but when it is from the other way around, that is from the internal network to the internet, you are actually bothered not only about the integrity, but you are also bothered about the confidentiality. Okay, so, these guards are technically known as the firewalls. Okay, so, they are known as the firewalls. So, typically there are three kinds of firewalls which are uh, used. So, the three types of firewalls are, some, are known as the packet filters, application layer filters and dynamic filters. So, we will just have a quick look into what are these type of firewalls and what is the basic principle of working of these, of these firewalls. So, as the packet filters are actually the foremost and most primitive technologies that analyze network traffic at the transport uh, protocol layer, each IP network packet is examined to see if it matches a set of rules. Now, these rules define the fate of the packet that is either it will be allowed or it will be blocked, denied. Now, there are some packets which filter, I mean we are, there are some packet filters which deny a packet if it does not match with either any allow rule or any deny rule. There are some which actually allows packet if it does not match with any deny rule. So, as I told you that your, uh, your firewalls can actually be more uh, inclined towards blocking or it can be also in more inclined towards allowing the packets. Okay? So, that depends upon the strategy of the, of, of, the, of the network and they do not actually understand the application layer protocols. So, they are actually, uh, they analyze the network traffic at the transport layer protocol. So, therefore, the packet layer sits at the transport layer and it tries to, the packet filters uh, analyze the networks at the transport protocol layer and not at the application layer protocols. So, they are typically kept in the TCP IP kernel and is applied to any incoming packet or outgoing packet. Now, typically the factors which controls the allow or the deny of the packets are as follows. The physical network interface or the adapter that the packet arrives on, the address the data is coming from, the address the data is going to, the type of transport layer that is whether it is TCP or whether it is UDP, the transport layer source port and the transport layer destination port. So, these are the typical factors which are actually maintained in the allow or the deny rules of the packet filter and they are checked, uh, uh, they are checked with the incoming or the outgoing packets. If they match, then they are allowed. If they are not, then either they are denied, they are, they are denied, they are blocked basically. So, the advantages of packet filters are of course, they are fast because they do minimal security check and they are very less complicated. They do not require the client computers to be configured specially and also they shield the internal IP addresses from the external world. Like you do not see exactly what is the internal IP address of the network when you are uh, communicating with the, uh, with the with the network uh, per, per, the internal IPs. Okay? So, the other, uh, but, but it also there are some disadvantages like they do not understand the application layer protocols and hence they cannot restrict access to the FTP services such as the put and the get commands. They are stateless and hence they are not suitable for the application layer protocols. The packet filters have almost no audit event generation and alerting mechanism. So, they do not do proper amount of documentation or do not maintain audits about, about uh, the network events. Now, I will give a brief example like this example is specifically written by for this IPFWADM which is an example of a cheap packet filtering tool which is a kernel based tool on Linux. The principle and even much of the syntax can be applied for other kernel interfaces for packet filtering for uh, any open source Unix system. So, here is an example, I will not go much, but if you do a man of this IPFWADM, then you will see that there are, these are some of the basic uh, switches which you have like the packet accounting, input firewall, output firewall and the forwarding firewalls. There are a lot of other switches also like you can also mention like masquerading capabilities. Okay, so, for other information on the switches, you can actually see the corresponding man page. 
Uh, here is an example like you can imagine that an organization uses a private network and this is the kind of IP which is provided and the internet service provider has assigned that the address as mentioned here as the gateway and this as the mail server. So, suppose this is the policy, the policy is like to allow all the outgoing TCP connections, the policy could be to allow incoming SMTP and DNS to external mail servers and it could be to block all other traffics. Okay. So, therefore, depending upon the policies different kind of rules are set like for example, uh, these are the some of the commands which have been provided here. So, these block of commands are generally placed in a system boot file. So, therefore, it could be like an RC dot local on a Unix system and these are kind of executed. So, you can see like there are various features like forwarding, denying which particular IP is being denied. Okay. You can also have uh, add your masquerading uh, capabilities and these are so therefore, these are the basic rules which are set by using this IPFWADM command. Now, whenever a packet incoming packet or an outgoing packet comes in then these will be changed checked against these rules and depending upon these rules either they will be allowed or they will be denied. So, this is an example of a cheap packet filtering tool, but often useful in the Linux based systems. So, as opposed to this you have got the other firewalls which is known as the circuit level firewalls. Now, the circuit level firewalls are similar in operation to the packet filters, but they operate at the transport and the session layers. So, uh, the biggest difference between a packet filtering uh, firewall and a circuit level firewall is that a circuit level firewall actually validates the TCP and UDP sessions before opening a connection or circuit through the firewall. But once this connection is established then the firewall maintains a table of valid connections and lets data pass through when the session information matches an entry in the table. So, therefore, it actually does a checking before opening of the connection, but once the connection is opened up it does not do any checking of the incoming packets. So, therefore, you can immediately understand that a circuit level firewall can actually be sometimes faster than a packet level uh, 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 the previous kind of firewalls. Okay. So, therefore, it can be faster than the packet filters. Okay. Now, the stable entry is removed and the circuit is closed when the session is terminated. To validate a session, these kind of firewalls thus examine each connection setup to ensure that it follows a legitimate handshake for the transport layer protocol. TCP is a widely used protocol and it actually uses handshake and the firewall maintains a virtual circuit table which stores the connections de connection details namely the session state and the sequencing information of the successful connection. So, you see that it can actually maintain some amount of state information and also some amount of sequencing information. Now, when a connection is set up the circuit level firewall typically stores the following it will store like the unique session identifier for the connection. Okay, uh, and it will also store the state of the connection namely handshake established or closing. It will store the sequencing information, store the source IP address from which the data has arrived. It will store the destination IP address where the data is to be delivered that is where it is going to the physical network interface through which the data arrives, the physical network, inter network interface through which the packet goes out. So, you see that most of the storages are exactly the same as that of the packet filter. The thing which is different is this sequencing information and the state information. Okay. So, therefore, this is a significant difference of what is stored compared to the previous uh, packet filters. Okay. Now, the, the circuit level firewalls can detect uh, TCPs. So, therefore, the circuit level firewall will check the header information content in the network packets to see whether it has the necessary permission to be transmitted. These firewalls have limited understanding of the protocols used in the networks. They only, only detect one transport layer protocol which is the TCP and therefore, and, and like the packet filters the rules are kept in the TCP kernel. Okay. So, they are kept in the TCP kernel just like the packet filters. Now, talking about security, these firewalls perform an email security check compared to the application layer firewalls as we will see that is only those network connections that are associated with existing ones are allowed, but once a connection is allowed all packets associated with the connection are allowed without further security checks. So, once it is allowed then there is no like once a connection has been allowed and it is included in the work, uh, virtual circuit table then the packets are not screened or not analyzed. So, it does more probably security check compared to the packet filters, okay, but uh, it actually does less compared to the application layer firewalls which we will discuss next. The method is hence fast and performs a limited amount of state checking. However, they perform limited checks to detect whether the packet data has been modified or spoofed. So, there is an amount of authentication involved in this uh, 
kind of firewalls. They check that the data contained in the transport protocol header complies with the definition of the corresponding protocol. So, uh, like packet filters, these firewalls also perform network address translation to hide the internal addresses from the external world. So, this feature is like similar to the packet filters, where the internal there is an uh, performed there is a network address translation which actually hides the internal addresses from the external world. Now, the advantages are of course, as you understand that they are faster, they are faster than the application layer firewalls, they are more secure than the packet filter firewalls, they maintain limited state information, they maintain some amount of sequencing information, they protect against spoofing of the packets, they also shield internal IP addresses from the external networks by performing the network address translation. So, these are some of the advantages. The disadvantages are that it cannot restrict access to protocol subsets other than the TCP. So, it is only specified to TCP. They have got limited audit event generation capabilities. So, this is kind of limited and they cannot perform security checks on higher level protocols. So, if you have got any higher level protocols, then these are not meant for them. So, as opposed to this, we have got the, th the application layer firewalls. Now, the application layer firewalls is a third generation firewall technology that evaluates the network packets for valid data at the application layer before allowing a connection. So, an application layer firewall is a third generation firewall which will actually uh, perform the uh, or rather uh, it will evaluate whether a particular data is valid or rather is allowed or not. And uh, it actually examines data in all network packets at the application layer and maintains a complete list of, list of connection states and sequencing information. So, here the documentation of the auditing is much more complete as opposed to the previous firewalls it actually maintains a complete list of the states of the connections and the corresponding sequence informations. Now, further other security items that appear only in the application layer protocols like user passwords and service requests are also validated. So, here we see that these kind of firewalls are actually meant for the higher level protocols. They have got more state information and they maintain a better sequencing information of, 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 uh, you know, of uh, I mean of the, of the corresponding protocols. Now, the application layer firewalls use special purpose programs which are actually called proxy services to maintain data transfer through a firewall for a specific service such as FTP or HTTP. HTTP. Now, proxy services are therefore, uh, special purpose programs which are used inherently in these kind of firewalls. Now, proxy services are dedicated to a particular protocol and provide increased security checks, access controls and generate appropriate audit records. Now, these proxy services of course, you under, as you understand that if they perform so much amount of auditing and it performs so much amount of security check, it comes with the accompanying disadvantage of making the system much slow. Okay. So, therefore, uh, these kind of firewalls that is the application layer firewalls are inherently slow in nature, okay, extremely slow. So, proxy services uh, uh, actually do not allow the direct connection between the real service and the user. So, they will they sit they sit between the user and the real uh, server and handles and inspects each and every communication between them. But of course, it ensures that it is a transparent it sits transparently that is the user and the real server does not understand that a proxy server a program is actually monitoring them. Now, a proxy service has got typically two components and it is often implemented as a single executable one is the server and the client the proxy server and the proxy client. Now, the proxy server and the proxy, so when it uh, has got the functions like this, like it, when a real client wants to communicate to an external service in the network like FTP uh, or uh, Telnet, the request is directed to the proxy server because the user's default gateway is set to the proxy server. So, therefore, when a real client wants to communicate or others uh, you can think like it wants, you can imagine like the Kerberos network that it there is a user which wants to access an external service in the internet, then uh, the, 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 the request is first directed to the proxy server. So, the proxy server actually is uh, sitting here because the user's default gateway is set to the proxy server. Okay. So, the proxy server gets the information and then evaluates the request and decides to deny or allow it depending upon its rules okay, and uh, uh, which are actually maintained by the network. And the proxy servers are aware of the protocols and therefore, allow only complying packets within the protocol definitions. Okay. Now, they also perform auditing, user authentication and caching services which were not performed by the previous firewalls. So, after that on the other hand once a packet 
from the real client is allowed by the proxy server, the packet is forwarded to the proxy client. So, the proxy client receives it after this, who contacts the actual service, server, uh, I mean actual service providing server, okay, that is the external, uh, that is the server which is sitting in the external network. And the proxy client subsequently relays back the information sent by the actual server to the proxy server who decides whether to send the information to the actual client. So, the proxy service is thus, you see that it is transparent to the user who believes that he is, it is actually communicating directly with the service in the internet, but actually it is communicating via the proxy server and the proxy client which together actually makes the proxy service. So, therefore, proxy services as you understand are slow because it makes the entire network slow. So, however, the proxy services are implemented on the top of the firewalls hosts network stack and operate only in the application layer of the operating system. Hence, each packet must pass through the low level protocols in the kernel before being passed to the top of the stack to the application layer for a th thorough analysis by the proxy services. So, the idea is that the proxy servers or uh, proxy services are implemented uh, using the network stacks. Okay. So, therefore, the idea is that whenever a packet comes, it has to move through the network stack and come to the server or the service and be analyzed. And again, when it is communicated back, it has again to, pop, it has again to pass through the stack and go back. So, therefore, the, the idea is that the entire process becomes extremely slow and therefore, uh, uh, I, mean, it, I, mean, it, I mean, if you want for example, speed in your network, then you have to actually use it carefully, like you have to use it. So, I mean, if you want kind, kind of a uh, I mean, your time is also a constraint. Like, if you if you want, like, uh, it has to be kind of a, it has to be uh, performed online or it has to be performed in real time. Then you actually uh, have to use these kind of uh, firewalls in a more uh, sensible manner. Okay, so so that is uh, one challenging part of these kind of uh, firewalls. So the advantages are that they enforce and understand high-level protocols like HTTP and FTP. They maintain information about the communications passing through the firewall ser servers. Okay, so it has got lot of state informations. They uh, can be used to deny access to certain network services while allowing others. So they are also capable of processing and manipulating the packet data. They do not allow direct communication between the external servers and internal systems. Therefore, it shields the internal IP addresses from the outside network. They are transparent between the user and the external network. They provide features like HTTP object caching, URL filtering and user authentication. They are good at generating auditing records which actually can allow or help the administrators to monitor threats to the core firewalls. Now, it has got uh, some disadvantages as well as we know one of them is the speed. They require replacing the native network stack on the firewall servers. So, they need uh, these kind of modifications. They do not allow network servers to run on the firewall servers as the proxy servers use the same port to listen. Okay, so, they are slow and thus lead to degradation in performance. They are not scalable as each new network services adds on to the number of proxy services which are required. Proxy services require modifications to client procedures. They rely on operating system support and thus are vulnerable to bugs in the system. So, therefore, if there are bugs in the systems like as we have seen in the previous cases about uh, there could be bugs in the standard C library, then it causes security concerns in the security provided by the application layer firewall. So, therefore, they have to um, I mean uh, they, they actually rely on the operating system. So, if there are bugs in the operating system, then these kind of firewalls can be vulnerable to threats. Now, we have got a fourth generation firewall which is actually called known as the dynamic uh, packet filters. So, these dynamic packet filters are actually the fourth generation firewalls that allow modifications of the security rules on the fly. So, therefore, it is a kind as, as the name suggests it is dynamic. So, therefore, the, uh, the security rules are not static and they are kind of modified on the fly. Okay? Now, this technology is most suitable for providing limited support for the UDP transport protocol. So, as we have seen that it actually extends to the UDP transport protocols like which was not supported by the application uh, layer firewalls. And uh, uh, so, this firewall associates uh, all the UDP packets that cross from the internal network to the external networks or vice versa with a virtual connection. If a response packet is generated and sent back to the original requester, 
then a virtual connection is established and the packet is allowed to pass the firewall server. So, therefore, we see that one of the advantages of this is that this supports the UDP packets and it maintains a dynamic set of rules which are actually uh, which allows or denies an incoming or outgoing packet. This is as opposed to the, so therefore, uh, this is as opposed to the previous things as we have seen here. Like when we consider the circuit level uh, protocols, then they only were used to reject one uh, the, the transport layer protocols which is the TCP. So, therefore, they were not applicable for the UDP, but on the other hand this is actually uh, helping us to extend the security checks to the UDP uh, networks uh, for UDP protocols as well. So, now the information corresponding to a virtual connection is remembered for a small unit of time. So, therefore, if there is no response during this time, then the time frame within the time frame, then the virtual connection is invalidated. So, therefore, in this kind of uh, dynamic packet or this kind of filters in dynamic packet filters, uh, there is a if the response packet is generated and sent back to the original requester, then a virtual connection is established and the packets are allowed to pass the firewall server. But if the response is not received within a particular time quanta, then this virtual connection is stopped and the packets are not allowed to pass. So, if no response is received within this time frame, then the virtual connection is actually invalidated. Now, the response packet that is allowed back must contain a destination address that matches the original source address, a transport layer destination port that, uh, so therefore, there is a uh, it has uh, it has to have a destination address that matches the original source address and a transport layer destination port that matches the original source port and the same transport layer protocol type that is the exact uh, transport layer protocol type which is which is being used now this feature is useful for allowing applications layer protocols like the dns or the domain name, the, the domain name systems So, the summary of what we have seen here is that application layer firewalls. Uh, so, if I if we do a I mean we would be interested to understand about uh, about a comparison among the existing firewall technologies. So, therefore, the application layer firewalls are the most secure secured among the existing firewall technologies and they are more secured than the dynamic firewalls which are again more secure than the circuit level firewalls which are in turn more secure than the packet level filters. So, therefore, the you can say that the most secured among all the firewalls is the application layer firewalls and the least secured is the packet level firewalls. Okay. However, performance wise the application layer firewalls uh, uh, or the filters or uh, firewalls are actually slowest, they are the slowest because as we see all that uh, because of the proxy services, the proxy services are inherently slow, they essentially inspect each and every packet which is being communicated by the user with the external service and uh, therefore, they are essentially slow in nature and also they have to perform or they have to essentially each and every packet has to pass to the entire network stack. So, that actually makes the entire process extremely slow and there are also large number of uh, auditing involved therefore, application layer firewalls actually performs lot of auditing. So, therefore, everything actually comes around with an accompanying time involved. Okay. So, therefore, it is generally slow in nature. On the other hand, the packet level filters are actually quite fast because they do some minimal checks. Uh, a point to be noted is actually the circuit level firewalls are often faster than the packet level filter. So, this is kind of a point which is to be stressed. So, as we have seen that although the packet the, the, the circuit level firewalls has got more security than the packet level firewalls, but they are actually more sometimes more faster than the packet level filters. So, so they because they often do not perform extensive security checks other than whether a network packet is associated with a valid connection. So, as we have seen that once a, a packet a network packet is associated with a valid connection, they do not perform extensive security checks. So, therefore, then the packets are subsequently passed without checking. So, packet filters have got on the other hand a large set of allow and deny rules. So, therefore, if there is a huge I mean large in a large network, then actually there will be a huge number of allow and deny, deny rules which can actually make your packet filters slower than the circuit level firewalls. Now, the other important uh, or other, the other accompanying question which can come up is like uh, is an IDS a substitute for a firewall or a firewall be a substitute, substitute for an IDS. Okay. So, the, the, the message is that I mean they are not actually competing technologies. Okay. So, therefore, it is a kind of accompanying or complementing technology. 
So, an IDS may only detect and warn about security violation. So, the idea of an IDS is kind of to do the vigilation, it will observe the network and see that whether there are any existing security violations. On the other hand, a firewall will not will actually not necess necessarily notify about a security violation. So, therefore, the as we have said that ID IDS although it prevents the main job of an IDS is actually to monitor the network and to see where, whether there are any security violations and actually document and aud perform auditing that is it actually helps the system administrator to understand the security threats. The job of a firewall is on the other hand not to notify the security violation that is not the prime job actually of a firewall. It is it, it may be is to simply block the attack or take some actions or take some uh, or, or is it to block the attack or block the action which actually violates the security policy of the firewall. So, it could like without even notifying the network administrator, it can simply block the particular attack and can prevent uh, threats to the network. So, in practice it is actually good to combine both an IDS and a firewall. An IDS, so we can say that uh, an IDS warns while a firewall blocks. Okay. So, therefore, the object, main objective of an IDS is to warn while the main objective of a firewall is actually to block. No, but, 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 but actually the new generation uh, uh, it is generally combined like it is, we cannot we do not generally draw a line between IDS and a firewall. So, it is a kind of a combined technology nowadays and for example, we can find in the Norton inter internet security where an IDS and a firewall is being combined. Okay. So, here is a uh, small I mean uh, an exercise which you can uh, try is that the Unix utility as we have said this IPFWADM can be used for controlling all incoming, outgoing and forwarding of packets. Okay, so, we can uh, do this, uh, we can install this packet from this particular URL which is provided and use the, we can use the utility to create a firewall with the following capabilities like uh, we can try to deny all the incoming, outgoing and forwarding of packets, we can uh, flush the rules and start from the beginning. Okay. So, uh, log and track any packets which are coming through the external perimeter it could be the gateway and pretending to be arriving from an internal IP that is a case of spoofing. Okay. So, therefore, this can be uh, tackled. We can also configure such that con configure using this IPFWADM tool such that any packets which have actually been originated from internal network, but masquerading as coming from the IP of the external perimeter should be denied. Okay. So, these are some of the important steps which can be taken by this kind of packet filters all other outgoing packets should be allowed that is those packets which have originated from the IP of the external perimeter and are being sent through that should be allowed. Okay. Now, we can also uh, configure such that masquerading is prevented from a particular IP in your network. So, these are some of the uh, some, some, some policies which can be enforced in our network and we can actually try to see that whether we can use the IPFWADM tool and we can enforce these policies. So, note that you should install and run this IPF WADM tool binary as a root okay, to your system. So, therefore, this can be a simple uh, exercise which we can practice uh, to understand the basics of packet filtering. Now, some of the references that we have followed for our text are these books. So, this, uh, this book like this guide to intrusion detection and privacy and prevention systems IDPS. So, this is, uh, this is an in, uh, and also you can refer to evolution of firewall industry the corresponding URL is given, it is a Cisco documentation. The other reference is internet uh, firewalls and some frequently asked questions and it is a very interesting read. So, therefore, uh, all of you are encouraged to read this, it is a very nice read. And uh, next day we shall take up the topic of uh, side channel analysis of cryptographic implementations. So, this will be the concluding topic. So, we have till now talked about some of the imp important parts of network security and we shall actually conclude our uh, our discussions and class with an important topic which is called a side channel analysis without which the discussion of cryptography and security will not be complete.